Over 150 years ago, in the capital city of Edinburgh, a long-standing conflict within the official Kirk of Scotland finally came to a head in what is known to history as the Great Disruption of 1843. Scotland had strongly embraced its homegrown version of Calvinism, known as Presbyterianism, in the late 16th century a church largely ruled at the local level by presiding boards of elders. Ever since the absorption of the Scottish Parliament into Great Britain's Parliament in the early 1700s, there had been strong governmental pressure to allow the Scottish nobility, known as lairds, to follow England's example and appoint ministers of their own choosing. This effectually usurped the local board of elders' traditional right and responsibility to prayerfully call a minister whose primary purpose would be to lead the people according to Christ's mandate, along with the local congregation's spiritual needs, and not according to the whims of that local laird, or, even worse, the civil government. After more than a century of discontent, a large group of pastors walked out of the General Assembly in 1843, forming what was to be known as the Free Kirk of Scotland, many forsaking their livelihoods, church buildings, and future security in order to follow their consciences, insisting that Christ's church belong to Jesus Christ alone. Horatius Bonar, along with two of his brothers and over 450 other ministers, was one of these brave souls. Long a passionate advocate of active evangelism and the sufficiency of Christ alone, he was pastor of a church in Kelso, located in Scotland's southern borderlands. The very essence of Christ's deliverance is the substitution of himself for us, his life for ours. He did not come to risk his life, he came to die. He did not redeem us by a little loss, a little sacrifice, a little labor, a little suffering. He redeemed us to God by His blood. He gave all He had, even His life, for us. In the very same year as the Great Disruption, He married Jane Catherine Lundy. Together they experienced the profound sorrow of losing five of their young children to death in fairly quick succession. Yet even in this, they could see the hand of God. He wrote of this experience. Spare not the stroke, do with me as thou wilt. Let there be naught unfinished, broken, or marred. Complete thy purpose, that we may become thy perfect image. Later in life, another family tragedy had the unexpected result of bringing him some of the same joy that Job experienced later in his life. A surviving daughter was widowed and then moved in with him, along with her five children. It was almost as if God was restoring his earlier loss. Early in his ministry, he was greatly disturbed by the fact that many of the children within his flock did not seem able to relate to the metrical psalms, which constituted the full extent of the music used within Presbyterian worship. A man who, from his own personal losses, profoundly valued the little children in his spiritual keeping and desired above all else that they have every opportunity to respond wholeheartedly to the living Christ. He deemed it a necessity to start writing new hymns with simple tunes that they could readily understand and embrace as their own. This began a lifelong creative habit for him. Often he would utilize his travel time on trains between evangelistic journeys to write new hymns. He authored somewhere between 200 and 600 hymns in his lifetime. An interesting side note, it was not until quite late in his life, where in 1866 he took up the pastorate of a new church, the Chalmers Memorial Chapel in Edinburgh, the city of his birth that he first attempted to introduce the singing of one of his hymns into the Sunday morning worship service. Two of the elders unceremoniously walked out of the service in protest. Horatius Bonar walked in that light of life until his traveling days were done, passing into the presence of his beloved Lord in 1889, along with his wife Jane who had predeceased him 13 years earlier. One of his last requests was that no biography be written of him. 
He could not bear the thought of his life story detracting from the glory and honor that he knew to belong to Christ alone. Happily for us, a number of his hymns are still in circulation today. The hymn we are presenting here is perhaps his best known, but just to stir things up a bit, we have wedded the words to a lovely traditional Irish tune. Knowing his love for the little ones and his desire for them to sing a new song unto the Lord, we suspect he would approve of this little break with tradition. My thirst was quenched, my soul 